So today's lecture is going to be about birds, and in this case, we're going to take the opportunity to discuss several of the adaptations that basically allow the colonization and success in really extreme environments. And in particular, we're going to start talking about thermoregulation and how animals do that. Of course, birds are uh, particularly interesting within the vertebrate group because they've evolved the ability to get up in the air. Of course, other organisms have also evolved that ability, and we'll talk about those different groups of organisms, but we'll particularly talk about the adaptations that birds have that enable them to get up into the air. These include feathers, uh, really cool improvements to the lung. It's a much cooler lung than we have, uh, as well as lighter bones that will help them to uh, reduce weight and therefore get up in the air. So this is the part of the evolutionary tree that we happen to be in. If you'll note, uh, birds are branching off of the reptiles, which is what makes reptiles a non-monophyletic group. So I just said that birds uh, are a branch off of reptiles, and it, that's particularly clear when you think about where birds came from. Birds came from dinosaurs, of course. Now, this was controversial for many, many years, whether birds were the descendants of dinosaurs. But I think it's almost universally accepted now. And there were a number of features that originally encouraged evolutionary biologists and paleontologists to draw these links that birds were really the modern descendants of dinosaurs. So, for example, there are a number of shared characteristics of birds and dinosaurs that seem to suggest this common ancestry. For example, they're both bipedal. Of course, they're not all the only things that are bipedal because humans are bipedal as well. Uh, but they have three hind toes. Yep, so it turns out this three hind toe thing is not correct. On the left, you have a diversity of dinosaur feet and a bird foot on the top. And then on the right, you have different types of bird feet. So you can see that there's a diversity of different numbers of toes and digits in both dinosaurs and birds, but you still see a lot of similarities in the structure of the feet. They're also carnivorous. They have this four-chambered heart. These are just shared features of birds and dinosaurs. Their lung structure, which is really cool, and I'm going to tell you about in a little bit, is also similar between birds and dinosaurs. They're feathered. This, of course, I think was really sort of the capstone on the argument that birds were dinosaurs, and that is that they found dinosaurs with feathers as well. They also have these, uh, at least some of the groups have these hollow bones that reduce the weight. And they have a particular number of other characteristics, such as extended periods of parental care of eggs in nests. One of the major criticisms of the origin of species was that there weren't transitional or intermediate fossils that people had discovered. Like, for instance, how do you get from dinosaurs to something else? Or where did birds come from? Where's the intermediate ancestor for birds? Well, uh, Archaeopteryx came out just, was discovered just after the origin of species. Now there are something like uh, more than 12 specimens. So uh, Archaeopteryx was a crow-sized bird, uh, early bird, and uh, it had a couple of these really obvious avian characteristics, such as feathers and wings, and you can see this beautiful fossil I took this picture in the Berlin Natural History Museum many years ago, and it's, it's almost a work of art. This is one of the most beautiful, I was about to say fossils, but it's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. This is an absolutely spectacular fossil and work of art. Right, so it had a couple of cool um, features that were clearly bird-like features, such as feathers and wings, and you can see them there on the Archaeopteryx as well as some more reptile-like characteristics, such as still teeth in its jaw, which birds don't have teeth anymore, and a bony tail, and you can see the bony tail right there. Okay, so birds almost certainly came from dinosaurs, particularly a group of dinosaurs called the theropod dinosaurs, which include things like Velociraptor. So currently there's about 9,600 recognized species of birds, all branching off from this common ancestor from one particular group of the dinosaurs. They're all amniotes, of course. We're in, am we're, we're in the amniotic group with amniotic eggs, and we talked about the amniotic egg last time. They're also endothermic. That means they're generating their own heat, and we're going to talk extensively about that today. And they have, of course, this four-chambered heart, feathers. Most of them can fly, although a bunch of them have lost the ability to fly secondarily. And they have a bunch of uh, diverse anatomical features generated by this evolution of this new thing, the beak. 
So the beak is turns out to be really good for birds because it's very light and it shows the potential to evolve into a huge host of different forms. And it's really one of the major bases of the incredible adaptive radiation of birds. That's just a cool uh, book there that uh, I happened to get for Christmas from my mom some years ago and it got a lot of the really cool birds on it. That's a shoebill stork on the, on the cover. Really cool bird and a cool book. Okay, so bird beaks diversify dramatically primarily in ways that allow birds to get this great diversity of different food types. And so here's a characterization of those different types of beaks, particularly in relation to the types of functions that they seem to serve. So for example, you have woodpeckers that have chiseling beaks, you have pelicans that have a dip netting beak, uh, you have surface skimmers, that's a skimmer, super, super cool bird. I'll tell you about it in a bit more in a minute. You have birds that scythe their beak back and forth in the water, uh, birds that probe their beaks in the, into the ground or in the mud. You have filter feeding birds like the flamingo. And then a whole host of other ones. Aerial fishing, pursuit fishing. You know, they're just so cool. I'm just going to go ahead and list them all right now. Scavenging like um, vultures. Raptorial beaks like hawks and eagles. Generalists like a crow in this case. Uh, insect catchers like warblers, grain eaters like Darwin's finches some of the Darwin's finches. Really cool crossbill beak in the North American crossbill. The beaks go like that, they cross over. Uh, you have nectar feeders like honey, honey creepers uh, and also like um, hummingbirds. And of course you have big fruit eating bills uh, like the toucan. Now you can see this great diversity of beaks just by looking around you. And so here's a bunch of pictures that I've taken over the years of birds doing various weird things with their beaks. So there you have a caracara in, uh, Pat in Patagonia that is feeding on a dead rabbit on, on the road. You have a chiseling beak of the woodpecker on the upper right that was at my parents' house and was making a new hole. Woodpeckers make a new hole for their nest every single year, which is critically important for the many other cavity nesting birds that then can't build their own cavities but use the ones that are built by woodpeckers. You have a hummingbird on the left from Trinidad. There's a Darwin's finch in the middle. Uh, there's a white ibis on the right from Panama that has that probing beak. You have a pelican over there, and I, I just love the picture, this picture of the pelican because the, the forced perspective gives it the impression that it's going to eat the, uh, the surfer. And that's a skimmer. So I saw a skimmer in the Brazilian Pantanal, and it has a longer lower beak, and it swims, it flies along just over the surface of the water, skimming its lower beak through the water until it hits a fish and <laughs> grabs it and pulls it up. And then there's a, um, a fishing uh, heron over there from uh, Lachine, where I had a house in Montreal, and it has stabbed a, um, a pumpkin seed sunfish. So, this incredible diversity of bird beaks used for this incredible diversity of different styles of life that they then um, allows them to exploit an incredible diversity of foraging types. If you look at Darwin's finches, you can see a small scale example of the really rapid evolution of some incredibly diverse beak forms. If you're curious, I did uh, several years ago a little video talking about the different finches and what they forage on and how their beaks are well suited for those things. One of the main things I want to talk about today and to use birds to motivate is this idea of organisms needing to maintain a particular temperature range. And different organisms do this in different ways and different organisms are able to do it to greater or lesser degrees. And so let's talk about that because it's a critical feature of all organisms, that is, they care about what temperature they are, and of the things that have the ability to regulate their temperature, including us, of course. Here are some of the ways in which organisms will gain or lose heat depending on the difference between their body and what's on the outside. So solar radiation obviously will warm organisms up, as will conduction from uh, surfaces that they happen to be touching. So if you touch a, you know, a hot pavement during the middle of the day, it feels really hot and that's heat that's being transferred by conduction to your body. Also, if you have wind blowing past you, it will move the warm air on the surface of your body away and therefore you'll have more loss of heat from your body. In addition, if you're wet or sweating, then evaporation will also cause a loss of heat from your body. So you have a variety of different ways in which heat can come in and out. And the key is for organisms to figure out how to modulate and control those different sources and losses of heat. So organisms that receive most of their heat from the outside tend to be called ectotherms, that is outer temperature. 
and they're absorbing external heat from the environment. Of course, we endotherms will also absorb some heat from our environment on like a hot sunny day. But endotherms also generate their own internal heat through metabolic processes. Endothermic generation of heat is because the metabolic process is an inefficient one. It wastes heat, and then that heat is used to keep our bodies warm. There's a cool picture on the upper right there of the difference between endotherm and ectotherm, where you see uh, it's a thermal camera and you see a human's hand that's holding a tarantula, and the heat is coming off the human hand, so it looks warm, whereas the tarantula is not releasing any heat, so it looks uh, cool. Now, it's much more complicated than this, of course, and so I want to introduce that complication by first just asking you, is this organism an endotherm or an ectotherm? Obviously, it's an endotherm, right? It's a bear, and so mammals are producing their own internal heat just like us. Uh, you've seen a whole ton of camera trap stuff from my cabin. Uh, this was some earlier ones that we had, which were pictures, and that's just a little bear, but of course, we have uh, much bigger bears as well. That's the exact same tree but obviously a much, much bigger bear, because this one's just sitting down and rubbing. And of course, you know, bears will sometimes come right up to the camera. Now we're going to talk about the cameras in just a second. As a matter of fact, we're going to talk about the cameras right now, because this endothermic property of organisms is exactly what causes camera traps to work. So what they have is they have a, a heat infrared sensor on the top there, and then they have a motion sensor on the bottom. Now, the sensors of the camera are arranged into different segments, and when the camera detects a warm object in the infrared moving across those segments, it will trigger on. So the infrared sensor is up here, the motion sensor is down here, you have two different cameras, and then on the inside, of course, you have the batteries, and you have the uh, monitor for setting up your camera trap setup. And you put it out, leave it out there, and it stays off until it senses something move across it, and then it turns on and records for a period of time. Okay, so we just all agree that this is an endothermic organism giving off heat, but it is considerably more complicated than that. For example, if you look at the temperature of a mammal that has a hibernation period, you see that it's not constant. So the red line here shows the temperature of a ground squirrel uh, as it goes through the, through the hibernation period. And so you can see that uh, in a period of a day, it will have a little bout of hibernation where the temperature goes down and then it will arouse up and the temperature will warm up and then it will go back down into the hibernation period. So when it wakes up, it increases its temperature and when it's not awake, that is it's hibernating, its temperature is lower. And you can see in the blue line that the metabolic rate closely matches that. So when the organism is waking up and warming up, then its metabolic rate goes up. But when it is uh, going to sleep and cooling down and going into hibernation, the metabolic rate goes way down. So it's also complicated from the other perspective, that is ectotherms. So let me just ask you this question. What is this thing? Is it an endotherm or an ectotherm? To be. Well, it's an ectotherm, right? Obviously. And yet, it's more complicated than that because here is a thermal camera turned on beehives. So the bees are actually generating a whole bunch of heat within the beehive. And the way they do that, for example, is that they can actually disconnect the muscles, uh, their flight muscles, from the wings. So they can actually fly but not have the wings move. And that can generate a lot of heat. Indeed, every once in a while, an insect will get warm enough to actually trigger our camera. So this means basically that endotherm versus ectotherm, that is things that produce a lot of energy inside, their heat inside versus get heat from the outside, is not the same as homeotherm, that would be a constant temperature, versus a heterotherm, that's a variable temperature. And here's an array of different organisms across this endotherm, ectotherm versus heterotherm, homeotherm axis. So, for example, um, ectotherms that are really also heterotherms are like fish so, um, and invertebrates. So they really just are whatever temperature the outside environment is. On the far right, you have things like us, most birds and mammals that are endotherms producing almost all of our own internal heat. Uh, and we also maintain a relatively constant temperature. 
But then you have B's in the middle and you have a, a whole series of other variations there, including mammals such as the mole rats, the naked mole rats, that actually are mostly heterotherms. Their temperature varies a lot. Naked mole rats are cool for a billion different reasons.